Just when you thought it was safe, Carol. Just when you thought it was safe. I don't know. I don't know where to start after what we just watched. I don't know. What, I'm, sh I'm. I'm wondering if, if our audience is still trying to pick themselves back off the floor. I know I am. <laughs> With that ending, but um, <laughs> nevertheless, welcome Pamela Rape to our second last interrogation room for the series. Was that just the longest pause on a Facebook Live intro ever? Yes. Thanks for going with me with that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we, we got everyone involved from the beginning. It was setting up the. It was setting up the. I just thought maybe intensity. I just won't ever come up for air. I was hoping you were. I was worried that there was a point there where you weren't. Yeah. So I'm glad that you did. I'm glad that you came to join us. I'm really. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. A little scared. A little shaky, actually. I, I find that really difficult to watch it, that yeah. stuff. You know, because you. It, you're so intent on and focused on doing your job well as part of an incredibly um, skilled team under the pump, pulling that stuff off. You're so focused on what technically has to be achieved, but also being there, being in the moment, all that kind of stuff. It's not until you actually watch it that you're aware. Um, I have this sudden kind of split personality thing. I see that's a person that I recognize as being the person that when she wakes up in the morning and looks in the mirror, that looks a little bit like me. And 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 it's I, just, I, I go through the feelings much more yeah. presently as I watch it as an audience member than you know in a weird way than what I was when we were making it because it was we were so under the pump. Yeah, and you sort of see it all come together, and you see it from all the different other characters' angles and camera angles as well. Mm. You, you receive the story as an audience member. Yeah, um, uh, but an audience member that's watching somebody that they know really well go through something horrific. Yeah, and what a Sorry scene it was. That. Yeah, what pretty full on. And I'm sure you're also nervous because you've heard from all of the other cast how intense my interrogation rooms are. And Absolutely, how, I'm terrified. I was expecting yeah. the swinging light and the... Yeah. All of that stuff. And happen. we don't let you get off easy. We go straight in and we, okay. we, we, we get to the bottom of all the fans pressing questions. Can I just say something first that I reckon would be really good is that um, um, I've heard enough about these and I've seen enough of them to know that there's a, a floating emoji thing. And I reckon that maybe people should just get a little bit of that off their chest. Um, and I know that you really um, uh, want Joan Ferguson dead. And uh, I think you should just, I think you should just release a little bit of that. So I think everybody should, I just would love to see if we could choke Facebook Live with how many angry face floating emojis come out. And I just, I would love to see how many. Just let, let, let's create a traffic jam, a, a, a log jam of angry, angry people. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on. Come how on, many have we got? Come on, guys. Come on, you can do we're better. We're not talking hearts, we're talking angry. No hearts, please. <laughs> right. Okay. Break the record for, so I'll see break the I record can, for angry faces. Let's see if I can provoke a few more. <laughs> I think you are the first person that has asked for angry faces. <laughs> but I think they've released it. Look, they're all, Listen, they're to play Joan Ferguson, you'd have to love to be hated on some level, would you not? Yes. And you do it so well. I mean, okay, yeah. let's, let's start at the okay, beginning. Because right, there's right, so much to do. There's right. so much to do, Pam. Okay. Let's talk about tonight's episode like we always do. Right. So I've got a couple of talking points here. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that I think we should, we should flesh out is around our friend Jakey the Snakey. So, Jake and, and, and Joan have had a very sort of um, twisted relationship, I, I think is the word I might choose to use for this over the last couple of, um, well, the last two, the last, this season particularly. Mm. And as usual, the freak is always two steps ahead of him and always just continuously keeping him as, I guess, um, her puppet, so as some people are calling it, or at her, at her uh, access because she's always got one extra step ahead. We see Jake basically com completely bottom out and go, that's it, I'm out. And then we have this intense scene where a calm, calculated Joan is just like, oh, Jakey, Jakey, Jakey. There is no out. Mm. Can you talk us through, I guess, playing these scenes with, with Bernie, who, who, who obviously you've worked with really closely this season, Lovely. and about keeping this almost like carrot dangling uh, chess game between Jake and, and Pam? Because at the same time, too, 
to be honest, Jane. Jake's her, sorry, Joan yeah. is one of sorry, Pam, <laughs> is one of her is one of the biggest allies in in, in yeah. her achieving what she's been trying to achieve. One of her only. Yeah. That diminishing circle of helpers. Um, I think that uh, it's so tricky. She she plays such a long game, and you have to forgive me right off the top that that. Um, my memory about the minutiae of, of Joan's strategy, it might get a little hazy because her game is so long. Uh, and certainly the, um, the kind of the Jake Stewart, Joan Ferguson trajectory began right back on that day in the isolation cells at the beginning of season four when it became clear that Niels Jesper was going to turn state's evidence or turn against John Ferguson so that her one secret weapon had gone to the dark side because mm. John is the, the side of goodness and light <laughs> and uh, and it was at that time when it became imperative that she have I mean uh, I think the, the, the lines that the script writers gave me was uh, dead man dead men tell no tale so it was imperative that like, that kind of um, objective through the course of season four was to um, get rid of the one person who could incriminate her. And Jake Stewart arrived and was interested and after uh, he presented himself and after uh, a certain amount of assessment, which is John Ferguson's way, watch, watch, learn, assess, find out their um, weaknesses, find out how they can be exploited, how they can be bonded to her, how they can be manipulated, how they can be used, how they, you know, you know, how to kind of get in and get them under her control. Once she kind of identified that, um, I think she felt that he was putty in her hands. I think the one thing that she didn't anticipate was that he would actually be so weak as to um, actually fall for Vera, not yeah. be able to be as emotionally strong as she thinks she is. Yeah, and I mean, it was so cutting. Obviously, you know, we, we saw saw so much tonight that Jake Jet definitely is in completely in love with Vera, but he was trapped and by circumstance. Poor I, Jake, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, doesn't make him a good guy. He's done some pretty some pretty bad things, but I guess it's been they're all been actions of circumstances leading to where he is. But that moment when Ferguson just completely breaks Vera and tells her exactly, you know, waits till she's. She's in love with Jake. You can see that Jake's in love with her. And there's just that that moment where she just says, it's all been a ploy. It's all not real. Mm. And the look on Vera's face is just like, you just have to say anything. You can just see it all, it, it all crumbling. And the satisfaction that Joan takes in doing that. And then the subsequent um, follow-on with Jake's reaction to that. It's such a massive moment in the sense that we've all been, so all the fans have been saying, come on, surely Vera's going to open up to Jake. But now she is aware of what Jake is. I guess it's a different sentiment because in the sense that we know that he genuinely does love her, but he did these horrible things to her because of his circumstance with, with Joan. And I think he realises that he was just a pawn in Ferguson's yeah. plan, which was, I mean, she articulated it very clearly at the beginning of the season, which was she was going to on guard Vera. She was going to destroy her emotionally, professionally, psychologically. And um, the sad thing was is that she was actually looking to have Jake do that and, she, uh, and it became very clear when Vera walks up those st st stairs that with a smile on her face that she just realises that she's going to have to do it herself. So she's really cut herself. She's a very lonely figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the end of it. She really is. She's got nobody left. Yeah. And I guess that's... The moral of the story, I think. The, the delight, though, in, almost that she seems to take in, in that moment. Do you think that that's the pinnacle moment where she feels that she finally has got has taken Vera down? Is that the final I moment? think she feels a certain kind of hollow victory, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, what I find fascinating about the character is that what she thinks she wants and what she really what's really going on, uh, she's so not in touch with, and yet they both coexist in a parallel, uh, in her psyche, 
um, and it's and it's the conflict and the, the times that those two things kind of come in collision with, with each other that create the complexity of her as a character and make her so kind of delicious and challenging to play, really. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of which, so from on that moment, we sort of I guess this episode there's such a there's such a there's such a twist with with Joan. We see her on a high and in complete control and her plan completely almost sort of seeing it out to where she thought it was, and then all of a sudden we see it completely flip on its head with with Frankie and Kaz joining forces mm. and forcing her to face this kangaroo court. Um, and we were talking about this earlier when we were talking about the scene, and I said, I really felt, and I used the word, what did I say to you? I said, she's admitted, but she didn't admit, but she didn't deny all of, you know, all of the things that she has done. And it's the first time that it was kind of voiced more widely than a few different people knowing here and then. And what I found so delicious was watching Joan lose composure and mm. just literally, she it's always composed, she's always one step ahead, she's always, you know, the clogs are moving in her brain to thinking and articulating what she said. And for this moment, I feel like we saw her very, very, very vulnerable and, and raw. Yes, although I think that has been coming for a while. Um, and I think it's probably that journey <laughs> Started when she banished the voice of her father from her yes. reality. Um, and it certainly then came home in a terrifying way for Joan Ferguson when B. Smith um, manipulated her um, emotionally um, by um, exploiting a a vulnerability in Joan and actually getting her to lose her composure and lose her emotional control, emotion leads to mistakes and all that stuff, um, and to actually drive that screwdriver in and then therefore incriminate herself and herself uh, for a crime that Joan, I'm sure, down deep believes that it was not her fault. The one time it was not her <laughs> fault and nobody will believe her because she's the, the little girl who cried wolf. Um, so I think it's been coming for quite a while. I also, I believe that um, um, two things going on there, that, that um, we took great care, and um, I have to say the, sc the screenwriters, the, the script writers for Wentworth, I, I mean, I'm going to be repeating things that other actors have said in these Facebook Live things, because let's hope that I can say it in slightly different ways, but I will I beg, beg your indulgence if I repeat what other people have said, but they are extraordinary. They have such a kind of long arc control over these stories, but also such great care and such kind of um, st structural inventiveness in a way that somehow makes what the incredible continue to happen. Where you think, "Oh my God, that can't! How can they top that? Oh my God, they just... Oh my God! Oh, oh my God, they just top that!" And there's something to do with. We took great care. And they listen to us actors. That's what I find extraordinary too. Um, it's a it's a it's a brave scriptwriter who listens to actors sometimes. <laughs> and uh, but they're incredibly generous uh, and straightforward. You know, if uh, you make a suggestion that's not picked up, it's always for good reason. Um, but there are times um, I think they've learned from very early on that part of the investment of the performers in this series is to do with um, how close they feel. Um, to the characters and um, they're living in their skins and it's a very intense environment and that that pays off with an investment from the audience members, the fans of the show, they mm -hmm. feel, you know. Completely immersed in it. Yeah, immersed yeah. in because we all are. And I know that we took, this is my answer to that question, great care about the wording of that and, and I remember at the time the wording was a little bit more blatant about basically owning up to doing all those things that Frankie accused her of in the yard there. And I said, I don't think Joan would ever give you a straight out and out. Yes, I did that. Uh, or certainly not in those particular circumstances. And that, but that, but that she would do a kind of a veiled version of that. And they were gracious enough to kind of um, work with me on, on this. A veiled version of it, but basically saying that but why she does, whatever she does, if she did that, would always be for the greater good. And I think Joan always... Felt that. felt that, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, her uh, her um, grasp of what was good <laughs> for everyone got a little bit more tenuous, I think, as she started to, to become a little bit unmoored from her stabilizing 
you know, elements. The voice of her father, the, the mantra that he would give her, um, Vera, uh, uh, any kind of um, um, the focus of uh, those fragile and um, delicate attempts at friendship that she might have had with Doreen or even Gianna in the past. Mm. Well, a, and I think it's no accident that with the um, death of B. Smith and what um, B. Smith managed to unlock in her that there is a kind of unraveling that begins to happen through this season. season. That by the time she's actually cut herself off from Vera, who was kind of her, her spirit animal, her, her yeah. kindred, her sister, yeah. um, that uh, under pressure, um, she releases more, she exposes herself more mm. than she even ever intended. And I mean, and, and we'll talk about this before too, the, the choice to kill Iman, you know, to, to, mm. to get at Frankie. I mean, that wasn't, you know, normally uh, Joan makes very calculated uh, decisions for, for strategy and things that we may not see at the moment, but mm. we'll, we'll, we'll unsee at the time. And this felt very much just to piss Frankie off, just to, to fuck with Frankie. I don't know that it was. I mean, I, I, it looks like that. I mean, we talked about it a lot. And I, and I think that um, ostensibly it, it certainly looked to Frankie like that. I also think, and this is to me part of the kind of slight unhinging um, that was starting to happen with Joan, the effect of being in prison too, you know. It's um, that she she became she becomes obsessed with the animal within, which I think is something that mm, she's they this. yeah yeah confronted her with, and so and Frankie starts to symbolise that, and it becomes really important to Joan that she gets Frankie to acknowledge and realise her own anger and her lack, lack of her own animalistic instincts. Mm. And so that gets kind of twisted into provocative acts to Frankie, whether it's verbal initially when she writes back, you know, there she is, there's the old Frankie girl, all that kind of stuff. But it's also to, uh, and, and it manifests in things that are just about mm. when Frankie won't conform to the way Joan wants her to be, won't be controlled. Um, it's doing things to... Um, Keep her inside, Sorry. keep Frankie in that jail because that's where she belongs. She belongs. Because that's where Joan actually belongs. Don't tell anybody that. <laughs> Please do not tell anybody that. Um, she doesn't think that, of course. She doesn't think that, no, absolutely. She's going to pop on her governor uniform and, and, and re, reinstate her place. Um, and so we, we, we talked about that. We saw the, we, I've broken the scene into two places, but we saw that the Kanga, the, the Kanga Court and, 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 jo, and Joan was in the closure. And then we see the lynching, which has numerous parts to it. I guess it's the, um, I'm sure people would love you to unpack the behind the scenes of how they actually do something so amazing and make it look so authentic and realistic. But it's also the reactions that you see in that scene. So Kaz is absolutely beside herself because she wanted to continue with her no violence and to be mm. ordered and to, to be what it was. confronting moment. And it just Kaz, yes. didn't, didn't go that didn't way. Didn't go to plan. You see what happens? See? Um, you see the Vera... Chaos. The chaotic people. Yeah, and you see Vera be the one that comes forward. Now, Vera has every reason to let Channing do what he's doing and let 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 Joan get what's coming for her. But, again, her moral compass comes in and, and it's just something that that she can't do or mm. can't see forward with. Um, and then the other aspect of it, which I'd love to get your insight on, it felt very much the same or kind of like an homage to that scene where where Joan, when she was governor, was watching the um, mm. the CCTV, when Vera was actually the one that was... Got the needle to her Yeah, head. it felt like an homage to that in a sense, but this time it was, it was Joan that was at the centre of it. Mm. And Vera coming to her rescue, whereas she didn't come to Vera's rescue in mm. the same, yeah. in the same moment. We actually are two parts of the same person, Vera Bennett and Joan Ferguson, and as Kate Atkins and I are the same person, which is probably why we haven't been in too many scenes together this season. Is that? <laughs> uh, I, I find it really moving watching that too, because um, because the way it's been edited, Jeff Hitchens I think did a fabulous job with that, I and mean, through so much material, Kevin Carlin is such a wonderful director and they had to achieve so much in minimal time I was moved on many fronts I was moved by the fact that you have to put so much faith into the skill of of 
these professional artisans. You just have to trust that somebody's going to be there, whether it's Tess Natoli and Megan Topman doing the makeup. You know that every, you don't have. You, you can't wait to ask people to do things. They have to be ready to do it to the extras to everything. Um, and I found that very moving on the day. When I look at the cut footage and see what Jeff sort of did it, and when the, you cut to all that, the footage, you know, the, the, the shot of Ali seeing her revenge on, you know, Bee's death sort of starting to kind of come home. You see the effect on Kaz. You watch uh, Sonia. You watch the shock on Boomer's face. Oh, Frankie's sort of, you know, all the, the kind of pride at being able to kind of gather the, the, the event, all that kind of stuff. Um, is that you feel all the history that goes back through, you know, four seasons really, all kind of coming home there, and that's extraordinary. And like you say, that relationship with Vera, that finally Vera gets an opportunity to show Joan Ferguson what Joan should have done when Vera, yeah, Vera was her life was being threatened because she's a good person, Vera. Yeah, it was. It just had so much. I think like. You do have the definite, you know, visual shock of, of, of the lynching and, and the makeup and the aesthetics and all that that goes into that is is just magical. But then, like you said, there's all these other moments that just make it this mm. the epic scene that it is. Mm. I, you know, I, like I'm sure that the viewers are still just like us, trying to to pick ourselves back up and say what just actually happened. It was just full on, and also actually doing it. We talked about it on the day. Um, um, I remember at one point, Tammy McIntosh going. Yeah, it's like, because you do actually, although it's incredibly um, safe, you know, all precautions are taken, and, and um, Zev Alaferiu, I hope I pronounced that right, Zev, when you're calling out to the stuntman in an emergency, you often don't go for the surname. <laughs> Thank goodness for Zev. <laughs> no, tricky one. just Zev. But I think, but Zev, <laughs> Zev, <laughs> Zev. Um, but in order to, you know, it's a it's a complex technical feat to pull that off. But in order to act it, you do have to get yourself a little bit close to, yeah, asphyxiation really. And so some of that was pretty scary. Scary. And that is actually a great segue into me talking about the evolution of, of Joan from from season two through to this season. And you, I guess, have had some pretty intense scenes. Some really intense scenes to film, that being one of them. And um, I guess your how you approach them and how you don't take them home with you, because it's very hard not to. Um, I kind of have been doing this for too long for it to be a, a huge problem. Having said that, you should probably speak to my husband because he might have a different opinion. <laughs> on. But um, it, it, for me, um, it's, it, it's a joy to play. Uh, and often the most intense scenes are really um, the scenes to relish and because we're all of us as a family of actors um, uh, get a lot of professional thrill working on this show and we enjoy working with each other and um, when you've got something really meaty to, to bite on into or you know chew on um, uh, you're fighting back the feelings of oh my god me at it kind of stuff and it's you're not going oh dear the the really hard ones are often kind of longer questions about um strategies or directions that your character might be going in and how am i going to pull that up? i mean for me the hardest stuff that, that i used to that i wrangle with and i continue to wrangle with is um the once joan ferguson ended up in teal and lost the kind of mask and the badges of authority and power did not have a right to govern in any sense or control um, how does she survive just mm -hmm. just like where where's the persona and that got quite tricky particularly through season four where uh, she needed a lot of people she had to get out of isolation in order to get a plan going yeah. and she needed to recruit and enlist the help of a number of people and that involved giving a lot of different messages to different characters different people needed different things so it was a great acting challenge but it was a, that was for me that was the, that was the a hard really one. hard one it was hard, hard stuff yeah, I'm not sure how successful it was because, no it was 
we're enthralled. I mean, I think that we, when we watch Joan, we're constantly like, we know she's two steps ahead of us. Can we catch up with her? Where's this going? Yeah. How's, this, how's this working? So the, the intricity between all of those, the way she thinks, is just as entertaining as the big monumental scenes like cutting out Juice's tongue and, you know, um, killing B. Smith. They're, just, they're all just as powerful. But funnily enough, there you see uh, the character that they've known to... Uh, They've grown to know and hate, and uh, and, and um, it's the ones where that you can't sort of mustache twirl from under a bushel. You know that that, that there are there were some pretty kind of intricate strategies that she was employing, particularly in the, in the season before this one, um, uh, which involved really keeping any of her kind of motives. Um, um, hidden from people, so that just occasionally the writers would put in a, they would just visit a little a private moment where you just got a glint in the eye or or, or mm. a tremble of something where you realise that there was this subterranean, that the old Joan, the bun was there even if it was invisible. It was just <laughs> it was still there, um, but it was just making sure that I honoured that and 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 made them proud. Absolutely. Yeah. And in, in saying that, what about the evolution of the relationship? I mean, we love we love seeing the, the, how Vera and Joan play off each other, and it was so amazing to see them in that you know in a position of authority and being governor and, and a deputy governor. And then we see the evolution with it being prisoner, prisoner and, and governor. Mm. How has that been for the both of you to play? Because we, we asked Kate the same question last week in how that's changed and how that's felt with the power the power shift and the way you both approached it. It's quite an evolution for both characters. It is, and I'm, and I, I, I mean, you know, I love Kate Atkinson so much. We have such fun working together, and I, and um, I'm, I'm sure Kate would say this too that I sort of missed that dynamic of the governor Ferguson and the deputy governor Bennett stuff. And uh, it's tricky when <laughs> Joan is trying to kind of maintain, you know, that relationship when she's. You know, a prisoner. She's behind bars, um, but that doesn't stop her from trying. And um, and we still, when we had the few encounters that we've had in this season, have been really fun. Delicious. In fact, we have to kind of wipe the smiles off our faces sometimes because we just so enjoy. Um, it, it's a great relationship between characters. It's a great dynamic, but also that's amplified by the pleasure that we both get professionally in working with mm. each other. And we look so fun. Yeah, I love it. So <laughs> you can hardly get us in the same frame. <laughs> Vera, no, no. Um, Vera? She's, where are you? Down there. Oh, there we are. <laughs> um, this, is, this is one that always comes up, and, and um, we've asked quite a few people this question, so it's interesting to hear your thoughts on it. When you were first presented with the character of Joan Ferguson, mm -hmm. what were your initial thoughts? Because obviously you didn't know where she was going to evolve to, but just in that very first moment of... of I think I was just so blinded with excitement. I mean, I was very lucky to come in at the beginning of the second season because um, they ironed out all the issues. <laughs> it sort of worked out a, a smoothly running machine. Uh, no, it was more to do with the fact that they um, they knew that they were in a hit show, which helped. You know, people just relax a little bit, and um, they were they were very generous and welcoming to me. But I also, many of them are colleagues and friends who I've either worked with before or know of socially. And the word on the street already was, even before it had gone to air, this is a good one, this is great. But I'd run into Chris McQuaid, who plays Jax Holt in season one. Mm -hmm. And I remember she, she just rapped on, it hadn't gone to air yet, but she said, this is a good one, this is a good one. So when the phone call came, I went, oh, yes, that's great. And I remember being ushered in on my first day, and um, Marcia Gardner, who's the script supervisor, uh, head writer, um, I was, um, it was her first thing, she, she joined season two as well, so oh, okay. we were both standing up, both very eager, both very excited, <laughs> and, um, but she'd been sitting with writers and developing all the stories for the introduction of the character of, of Governor Ferguson, and uh, you can call me Governor, and um, uh, I was ushered into her office to say, Marcia, Marcia will tell you what is going to happen and just the basic kind of arc of your character. I don't remember a word. I don't remember a word of anything that anybody said to me. I was just so excited. <laughs> like a puppy. Money in the headlights. <laughs> let me at it. Let, give me the bun. Just give me the bun. Um, 
you know, and I and the 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 pleasure of working with people like Tess Natoli and Troy Follington, who helped with a makeup department and hair that, that developed the look, and uh, Michael Davis, and all the people kind of working out the, the 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 way the character would look. It was one baby steps, one at a time. I knew probably that the character would be up to no good. I've said this before in 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 media stuff, but I remember on the first day of meeting my fellow cast members apologising in advance for all the terrible things that my character would do to them <laughs> through the course of that. I knew it would probably be up to no good. Um, and amazingly, people were still very nice to me. So it was, it was great. I had no idea where it would go. Yeah. No idea. Still don't. It's still just, it's just this powerhouse that keeps growing. Mm -hmm. um, on that, the freak is the villain that viewers love to hate. And um, she's complex, she's intelligent, she's strategic. How do you personally draw on portraying such a deliciously intense character with such authenticity because Pamela Rabe is not evil and not sadistic and, and, and none of those things? How do you know that? Oh, because really know? everyone tells me. In the lead up to today, everyone was like, oh, you've got Pam, she's so nice, you're going to have so much fun. And I've That's seen. That's very sweet. I, 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 you know, it's it's such it's a totally untrue, but really. complex and delicious character. So where do you in, where do you draw from? Um, um, I think I don't know. When you look like this, I don't know. I mean, honestly, uh, all I can remember is that I played Goldilocks when I was in kindergarten. Not a success. And um, <laughs> did you wear a wig or did you <laughs> have Goldilocks? But my hair was a little bit like it was more like brown with a little blondy tip. Um, and um, but whatever it is, it just didn't resonate. And then um, uh, the first movie that I'd ever seen, um, when I was three, I was taken by a next door neighbor's mum uh, with my best friend next door uh, to go see Snow White in Seven Dwarfs. And I remember I was under the seat when the evil queen stepped yeah. up. Um, came on. I was terrified. And obviously, as a three-year-old, I learnt on some really basic level that that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> now that's interesting. That's exciting. You know, little birds and... Yeah. Oh, not so no. exciting. And so, which for somebody else, another actor, it would be. But for me, there's something about that. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but when I look back on it, because to be honest, I have now, I've played the Wicked Witch of the West in Village of Oz a couple of times, and that's taught me a lot of things about Joan Ferguson, yeah. but I've taken obviously into Joan Ferguson. Um, and if there was one image, this is, this is just, if there was one image that I took into as we were, well, there's two images, as we took into developing a look for the character, I remember discussing with Tess and Troy, the Kurosawa movie, this is highbrow now, Get your pencils out and take notes. Um, the Kurosawa movie, Throne of Blood, which is his adaptation of the Macbeth story. I was so taken by the Lady Macbeth character, who was incredibly still and terrifying. Um, that combined with doing a drive up the, um, the highway towards Alice Springs once on this huge hearing where there's no speed limit and just the shimmering mirage of the highway. And in the, on the horizon, there was just something, I could make out a lump, I don't know what it was, and then I realized as I got closer, it was this miraged carcass of a cow that had died on the side yeah. of the road. And still, you know, you're several kilometers away, but it's kind of coming into focus. And then the, probably one got maybe half a kilometer away, suddenly this explosion of birds, you know, predatory birds, all disappeared. But as we got close, one bird of prey, one huge something, vulture, eagle, whatever it was, just stayed there with its claws on this carcass as the car went by. And just this, just in this moment, like a David Lynch freeze frame, I could just see just a ripple of the wind of the car as it went by at 120 k an hour, or whatever it was, <laughs> just riffling one little feather, but nothing else. And then it, as we parked, just back down to the but carcass again. That's John Ferris. Wow. Wow. What two? I didn't expect the the, the second story, <laughs> but amazing, amazing nonetheless, absolutely amazing. 
Um, and before we wrap up in talking and talking about all these things, so I guess I, I don't. I only speak in essays. I love. No, I'm so enthralled. Without I'm punctuation. Sitting here waiting for the story. Um, what do you? I mean, I'm like, I ask this to all the guys, and they all do say the same sentiment. But I just love it so much, so I'm continuing there. What do you love most about creating this series, and being part of it? I'll say what everybody else says. Um, um, great writing. Working with people at the top of the game, people who are really invested in, in um, what they're creating, um, in female-driven stories. It's just, that's so fabulous. Just fabulous. Yes. Thank you, Amanda Crittenden, Joe Porter, Peggy Wynn, Brian Walsh, everybody that's involved in the creation of this, Pino Amenta now, that, that, who's our um, series producer at the moment. But it's just, it was it was Amanda, Joe, and Penny, particularly at the beginning, and well, Lara. Or, anyway, yeah. Look it up on IMDb. <laughs> Those people deserve to be kind of got into a big group hug because it's something. Um, it's unusual, although it's not that unusual because you know the original Prisoner, Prisoner Cell Block H for mm -hmm. six people series was extraordinarily successful, and for a lot of the same reason, people love to see a lot of women of all shapes, sizes, ages, sensibilities, moralities, everything. They're not perfect. They're flawed human beings. Um, but actually um, drive stories. And um, it's yeah. a real privilege and an honor to be involved in that. And that's why we all love it so much. We love it. More well, of it, I say. More of it. We're going to have a little break and have some fun. <gasps> and I'm going to issue with you this paddle. You know what this paddle means. You've seen what the guys do. Oh. It says innocent or guilty. All right. Who's now I'm... Who has touched this? I lots of people that. probably have. Actually, the last person to touch it was... Who was last? Kate. Kate Atkinson. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was, and it was Katrina before her. Oh, so that's all right. Yeah. Um, are you ready? I'm gonna sh I'm gonna shoot some questions Guilty. at you. Innocent. Innocent. Are you ready? The first one is. Yes. Have you ever been in a fight? Innocent. Oh uh, no, that would be a don't. I won't tell the story. Never mind. <laughs> no. Have you ever? Wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever called into work sick because you were hungover? No. No, you can't. you're also committed. Well, you can't. Do you have any tattoos? Innocent. Do you sing in the shower? Not anymore. And uh, to be honest, that was I used to a lot, and I was fabulous. I thought, and then I shared digs with an opera singer, and if anything knocks that out of your system, <laughs> somebody who does it professionally, I just like, oh, no point trying this. <laughs> the noises that would come out of that shower stall. You do I mean, always sound amazing also. in the shower, though. Yes. Um, have you ever been arrested? Innocent. Have you ever sent a text to the wrong person? These are all going to be innocent. Uh, clearly. Look an at angel. this. Yeah. No, John I don't Ferguson think I, is an angel. I don't think I don't, I don't send that many texts. Actually. Um, yeah. No. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, and I'm constantly bailing my husband up because he never spell checks, and some of the strangest things go out to people. I'm, I'm the kind of person who spell checks their texts. I mean, that's not the point, is it? No, you need anyway. to spell check your text, though. I do feel. I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, have you ever been totally freaked out by a fan? Can I just, I, I'll sit in the fence on that one. I, it, I wouldn't say freaked out, but no, I've, I've been impressed by a lot. <laughs> Unusually impressed by a lot of <laughs> fans, particularly John Ferguson fans. It, it, she attracts a very special breed. And I'm full of admiration, and, and uh, they're very impressive. I, I would say that very early on in my career, there was a, a one fan encounter. Can I tell you this? Yes. Sorry, oh, I'm trying to make this really we're short. We're hanging on this every word. Okay. You, have, you have to understand that um, I was very young. It's like 30 years ago. And I had done a play uh, with the marvelous Miriam Margulies. Some people will know her. She's an extraordinary um, icon. People will know her as Professor Sprout in the Harry Potter movies and the Spanish Infanta in uh, Blackadder and a gazillion things. Anyway, um, 
the first time we worked together was on a, uh, a play about Gertrude Stein and Alice Petopoulos, which was a um, uh, success list in French. And um, it was invited to a um, event in North America in Michigan called the um, the Michigan Women's W O M Y N S International mm -hmm. Music Festival, which is an extraordinary event. I think it's only just recently stopped. It went for like forty years, and it's a I mean really special, extraordinary event. Um, it was described by its um, CEO um, Boo as. Um, once a year, like Brigadoon, out of the mist, 10,000 lesbians descend on virgin woods in northern, northern Michigan to, um, in, a, in a safe place, celebrate who they are. I mean, it's a, it's a, it was a, it's a feminist lesbian festival. And um, Miriam and I were invited to present this, uh, a beautiful play about Gertrude Stein and Alice Petopoulos, who are uh, extraordinary. I mean, look them up, Google it. If you don't know who they are, I'm sure you do, but you know, that it's, uh, it, it was a really special play. In a very special place. And I'm, I'm trying to, I want to make sure I'm not I'm giving you any impression that I'm trying to kind of um, make fun of this at all, because I'm not, because it was extraordinary, and it was mind-blowing, partly because the week that it took place, um, it's like Woodstock, you know, and it's very hot, middle of summer, um, it is a safe place, it's women only, um, and, you know, a lot of the women uh, are naked, um, they're there to celebrate, I mean, some big names are playing, Tracy Chapman, Holly Near, Sweet Honey in the Rock, people like that, and, and um, but it's a, it's a sensory overload, there's a lot going on, yeah. and uh, when we performed the play, uh, it was during daylight hours, I played Alice B. Topless, and at the end of the performance, this crowd of several thousand women, who we could all see because it was daylight, um, so it's extraordinary feeling this, I mean, it's an, it's an extraordinarily important relationship, I think, Alice B. Topless and Gertrude Stein. Um, and and it, it was deeply meaningful on so many levels to uh, the women in this audience who were watching it. But clearly, one of them, who was very uh, drawn to the Alice B. Toffler's character, and particularly came up to me at the end of the performance, this is my fan encounter that I found, not freaked out, but a little overwhelming, and I will never forget it for my whole life, is that she was wearing a raccoon skin, kind of Davy Crockett style hat, and nothing else, and asked if she could keep my cigarette butts that I had smoked as Alice B. Toffler's as a memento of the performance. And I just remember at the time <laughs> not knowing where to look. <laughs> I was so young. It was just, it was, you, I'm was older your, now. What was your answer? I just, mm. <laughs> sure. You really, and she put them in her coonskit hat. Yeah, because where else would she put them? And, um, <laughs> Oh, I thought I will never forget this for the rest of my life. That was special. For the special overwhelming. moment. It's overwhelming yes. moment, not a freak not out Not freaked moment. out, but no. yeah, I'll carry that with me. Awesome, awesome. Sorry. So on to that, speaking of nude, have yeah. you ever done a nudie run? Uh, well, a nudie walk, can I say that? Yeah. And this was professional too, because this is I was doing... <laughs> this is so silly. I'll try to make this really short. I, was, I made a film in the early 90s called Sirens, a uh, John Dyden movie about Norman Lindsay and the, the, the kind of artist family that he had up in Springwood in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales back in the um, early 20th century, 20s and stuff. And um, um, John Dyden wanted to capture this around the Springwood. It's still up there. It's a museum. It's a beautiful, beautiful property, beautiful house, restored and very cared for. Um, and uh, there are a lot of beautiful statuary around that Norman himself, the artist, had created. They're still there, you can see them. And John Dygan wanted to have a moment just that he could catch on screen of one of the statues in the middle of the night in a kind of dream sequence coming to life and stepping off its plinth and walking away. And um, I actually think he wanted somebody else to do it, but I was the one who went, oh, and uh, <laughs> I, I can remember at the end of a very long shoot um, on a, an extraordinary glorious still Sydney Blue Mountains night, 
them finally on wrap going, wait a minute, this is perfect, let's grab it now, and being rushed into makeup, getting the full head-to-toe concrete makeup done, getting um, up onto that plinth, and it was all really quick because I really wanted to do it really quick while the, the, the cracker going around, Colin did the cracker, and so it was just still near, nothing was moving, and they went, you can do this, you can give it a count of eight, step off the plinth, and then walk into the trees. And um, so they were going, and action. Still walked off the plinth, turned around, walked away from camera, camera into the trees, and further into the trees, and just kept walking. And they were so pleased with the shot, and it was rap. Nobody came and told me. I just kept walking. I got like a kilometer. <laughs> Walking into the blue mountains. I just had visions of you know being found by a bushwalker, you know, at eight a.m. the next morning, this naked woman covered in concrete makeup, going, "Excuse me, can you tell me the way?" Have we wrapped? Yes. <laughs> so we called Some the same. breathless third finally came running after me. Oh, that's so that's a, a nudie walk. That's a, so nudie a nudie walk. walk. Um, have you ever regifted a gift? Oh, yes. Yeah, haven't we? That's all. what you do with a gift that is more meaningful to somebody else than it might be to you. <laughs> Spread the love. <laughs> Have you ever considered being on a reality TV series? No. Have you ever had a crush Maybe on a, a cast? Cooking show. Cooking no. Show? Have you ever had a crush on a castmate? Oh, yes. Anyone in particular? All the time. It's crush. Whatever gets you up in the morning. Yeah. As it were. <laughs> has, have, has, has a fan ever mistaken you for somebody else? Um... Not really, yeah, a little bit. So um, they say I remind them of somebody else, like whether it's Angelica Houston or... Oh, okay. Lassie, things like that. <laughs> Lassie. Um, and last but not least, have you ever gone commando? <laughs> at, at the Michigan Women's <laughs> Festival, I mean, Miriam, who I've never seen flabbergasted by anything, even she was a little... Uh, taken aback by some of the stuff going on. I do remember on the last day, having been surrounded for so many days by a lot of women not wearing clothes and actually, you know, feeling free and liberated. I remember on the last day that we did walk, you know, it was very hot and everything like that, you know, onto, onto the land. And, and uh, um, she said um, to me, I'm not wearing a bra. And I said, neither am I. <laughs> that was that woman. <laughs> when in Rome, right? That's when in right. Rome. Just giving over. <laughs> Over. Well, this is the moment. Thank you for that game, Pamela. This is the moment that all you fans are waiting for because I've seen all the questions coming in. This is where they get a little bit, they get to take over. And it's all about them and you. <gasps> and I shut up and I just literally ask them Be what they want to know. Please. I've been through a lot. Now, they are very good at writing questions. They've had some really good questions. <laughs> Look at so. Now you see where this all came from. Look, cleaning, cleaning. <laughs> that, that, that was my one touch that, you know. Okay, I'm going to start with da, 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 Justin Dowdle. Hello, Pam. Hi, Justin. I have one question. Oh, Firstly, no. though, you're a brilliant actress. Oh. That episode was intense. Sure was. How do you get motivated to act as the freak? You're brilliant as her, and I absolutely love your work. Justin, um, I think I probably have answered that in my yeah, very long-winded have. answers, so I hope I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean to be kind of, you know, you know, but I, but I, I was going to say tossing you off. No, I, I wanted to read right it at all. because he obviously is real, he's a big yeah, fan. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, such those are such kind words, um, and I, I think that it does go back to the when the writers give you really, really exciting stuff to 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 do. Um, it's a pleasure, and and intense doesn't become actually intense is that's what you go to work for. Yeah. Um, this is from Kiana Redman. Hi, Kiana. Oh, my God, Pam. I love you, even though I kind of hate Joan immensely. You Kiana, so can, you give me a little, can you give me a little love heart and a little angry face at the same time? Yeah. Can you do that? <laughs> you are so phenomenal and your acting is out of this world. Who or what would you say shaped you as an actress? Um, beyond Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and <laughs> yeah. who or what shaped me as an actress. Um... It's a combination, obviously, of many factors, and, you know, um, I come from a very large family, and there's a lot of characters in there, and as you can tell, we all love telling stories. My mum's side of the family, um, I just remember them all. Um, Rabe is my mother's main name, and, and um, 
they're, they're laughers, the people who laugh till they cry. And so much watching, you know, grown ups mm. weeping in hysterics as I was growing up. And my dad's side of the family is um, a much sterner kind of Eastern European. <laughs> And something about the collision of those two things, I reckon, it was good fodder for it. And then I was just gifted enough to have a, I don't mean gifted, I mean I was given the gift of having um, two absolutely fabulous uh, drama teachers in high school. Yeah. And well, actually teachers all the way through school that were just in combination seemed to um, make me realise it was something that I enjoyed doing and then also it was something that maybe that you could do for a living. Yeah. Yeah as long as you could survive. As long as you have enough roles. Um, this is, I don't, I, I, I don't know exactly, I'm going to read this person's name. This person's name is Rabe's a goddess, future Mrs. Rabe. But it's a good question. Oh, I'm ring off now. <laughs> when you have a few minute breaks during filming, what do you spend your time doing? <laughs> is that, is, is that a leading question, my future wife? Yeah, possibly. I have been known to play the occasional Candy Crush. Ooh. I have moved on. I'm on to Jelly Crush now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Victoria Atwood, I just wanted to say you're the most am amazing villain I've ever seen on TV. Thank you, Victoria. How hard is it to play your character, and do you have any similarities with her? Um, well, obviously, I'm I'm a, I must have some. Um, um, she has my eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I hope I don't have too many because that would be a little bit scary. But I think down deep, I mean, what I love about her as a character is that she's a manifestation of all those things that you just do not do. Mm. So that there's, uh, there's even a part of me that, uh, that when, I, when I talk about it being delicious or it's something that you relish, it's because it gives me permission in a safe environment to indulge impulses because it's Joan and, you know, it's a story. It's a fiction. It's not real life. It's a fiction. It's pretendies. It's pretendies, as Kate Hackett says. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that um, in the end, how Joan, uh, you know, how I manifest the responses at the writer's script is about me just, and I try not to think about it too much, just yeah. I try to just let, just open that... <laughs> trap door and just let them let her out. out. Let her out. Um, Beth Mason. That's the animal <laughs> thing. Beth Mason, what's your first reaction when you get given a script with a particularly violent scene, i.e., cutting out Juice's tongue or killing a mom? Um. Uh, one is technical and one is psychological. So it's uh, you know it's. Uh, what has to be achieved and how we're going to do it. I mean, that's when Graham Jane or Zev, I love three of you, you know, are indispensable in combination with the director of the episode. Um, and the second one is always why. Why? Why is that happening? Mm -hmm. And and kind of with, in consultation with the writers and the director and sometimes fellow actors and stuff, working out a way to, um, you know, Put that next pearl on the chain, oh, or the yeah. bead, on the thing of working out right. And I mean, I've learnt so much about Joan Ferguson through the co course of these last whatever it is, four seasons, um, um, because they keep giving her n different things to do. There's a, a new expression of the extremes that she'll go to, or or the kind of constraints that she's under suddenly make uh, another part of her personality yeah. erupt and. You know, integrating that, making it feel psychologically authentic is really important. Yeah, and and, and you can do an amazing job of it. Um, Philip Nat, I'm going to pronounce your name, Philip Natras. How many puddings did you actually have to eat when filming the scene in the dining room when the women elected you top dog? <laughs> Not too many because I'm a one take wonder, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the. Um, a few, but I love that scene. For any of these, you know, eagle eye, you know, food watchers of Wentworth, people might have noted that Joan never ate anything. No. Um, you know, biscuits and wrappers, and she finally got a level of a sense of. She 
felt she had the kind of situation under a certain amount of control, she'd have a little bit of butter in packets. And this is where Paris McKenna Smith, the props, standby props master, is, I love him for life, um, because he would always indulge me with all this stuff, is that I felt was really important. She was, it was so clear that she'd be poisoned by anybody, that she'd be very, very careful about what she put into her mouth. Yeah, yeah. But that when she finally was recognized and acknowledged for the supreme leader that she is, at the end of that episode, she finally felt safe enough to just woof that down like <laughs> nobody's business. She finally, finally, finally got some of the calories into her. Yeah. Um, this one's from Jess Brown. Mm-hmm. And I think Hi, this Jess. is quite an interesting one. Do you think Joan is a victim or a villain? I'm pretty sure she's a complex mix of both. I interesting agree with your you, thoughts. Jess. I agree. I agree. Because um, she's clearly a, like that, that the thing I said at the beginning about these two levels of. She's so out of touch with her unconscious motivation in a way that uh, the things that drive her or the damage that fuels her needs, um, that she's oddly enough a kind of a victim of her own psychology. Mm. Mm. And yet that drives her to do some pretty villainous things, obviously. She just wants to be loved. She just wants everyone... Isn't that a running theme? Everyone just wants to be loved. Uh, and I th- and I also think, though, that, I mean, I, I, I mentioned this, I think, around the, the end of season three, too, that it's quite ironic. Really, I think that Joan Ferguson, you know, she came in as the fixer in that prison, and really, ideally, what she really wanted was everything to run like the music, to run in great polyphony, mm. harmoniously, in her mind, the best way to do that was with her at the pinnacle, this great triangle, this great heap, this mountain of people all yeah. doing her will, because her will was the best. Right. But that it was about everybody working in concert, and the irony, of course, is that when they finally do work in concert, it's against her. <laughs> but at least she got them all together on one thing, singing the same song. Absolutely. I'm just, you know, I guys, I just have to put it out to you. These questions are absolutely amazing and super intelligent, and I honestly am just, I'm overwhelmed with, with, with how many great questions that are coming in. You see? There's so much love John for you, Pamela. And, fans, you see? And that, you know Even what, the there's haters, actually I quite a lot of empathy for, for, for Joan. And, and it's not that they hate her, they love to hate her. This one's hilarious. This is from um, Wentworth Memes. She wants to say, eyebrows always on, po- on point, totally jealous. And you know, actually we saw in this episode when, when um, Joan was talking to to Jake, she was crafting those on. Well, she'd need to spend some time on them, I think. So I thought yeah. it was important that we had one little glimpse at what goes on in the mirrors. Yes, I'm being told to wrap up. <gasps> Look at this. Sorry, I'm being told to wrap up. I'm going to ask. Oh, don't. I'm going to ask two more questions from you guys because they're so amazing. I'm going to be like Erica Thomas. Erica, how are you? Do you believe Joan truly is a psychopath, or do you think years of abuse and trauma have made her what she is today? Um, um, I'm going to give the short answer to that, which is that, I mean, it's a spectrum of psychopathy, is it not? Mm. Um, I think certainly the very fact that the writers have um, uh, given uh, Joan a lot of strings to her bow, and I mean, it's, and it's been apparent from where the stories have gone that she does have emotional responses to things. So she does have emotions that she keeps trying to keep in check, and, and um, although she's incredibly skilled, you know, psychopathic, certainly a sociopath, um, way at uh, manipulating those emotions, um, you know, and employing what she knows about her great kind of Mm. acuity, if that's the right word, um, uh, 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 um, of her observation of others' emotions, all that sort of stuff. She's herself vulnerable, and she does feel so, um, but she just spends a lot of time trying to keep that at bay. Mm. So I think that she's a cocktail, obviously, of very many things. Yes. And a question... misunderstood cocktail. <laughs> a misunderstood cocktail. A um, invented cocktail called Joan <laughs> Well, what it would be called... The muddled the freak. freak. <laughs> yes, um, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is a question that I'm not going to put a name to it because loads and loads and loads of people have been asking it, so yeah. I'm going to do it as a... For all of you, yes. do you prefer playing a prisoner or a governor? Um... Oh, you see, I think, as you can see, particularly from this season, Joan thinks she's still the governor. <laughs> so, um, 
I, uh, to be, I, I sort of missed the bun and, and, and the uniform and the epaulets and, and it, because it gave automatically, as I said, that kind of an armor yeah. and a mask. But I certainly have loved the challenge, professional challenge really, of trying to kind of um, keep the character true when all the trappings have disappeared. Mm. So it's a hard one to answer. I think the great thing though about teal and sea across the board is everyone wears their teal differently. Yeah. And they wear it to, I mean, they've, they've been stripped of everything. And yeah. they, but they still, they still wear their teal to who they are, to be able to represent themselves to a certain extent. And what we see, what we see with Joan is, is that the hair, it's not in the bun, but it's in the, yeah. the tight the hint tail. at it. And it's a lot of effort when, when the little frizzies, I call them my, um, yes. Al Lewis Grandpa Munster, um, <laughs> little frizzies come out. And Michael was really great, sort of uh, honing in on that look for the um, the freak and teal, John Ferguson teal. And I said, "Do you remember from One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest? You know, Chief. There's something about that. I just wanted her to look like the Incredible Hulk. You know, that there was something yeah. just that the, the massiveness of her um, would sing in that teal. You know? mm. And and, um, just, that's something I and her teal is immaculate. You know, it's it's not yeah. ratty. It's it's very. It's yeah. like the best the uniform can be worn. Yeah. Do you oh. want to call it a uniform? Yes. <laughs> well, well it's, she, she'll pay as much attention to it as she does to, to Yeah. The and one and the one last one that we ask everyone yeah. yep. is what Foxtel TV series are, do you love to binge on? Oh. You can't say Wentworth. Exactly. I can't you say Wentworth. Because I do love watching Wentworth when the audience watches it. Um, um, probably the last one would have been... Mm, Feud, the Bette Davis, John, uh, oh, I love uh, that. John Crawford thing. Um, uh, gorgeous actresses, Susan Sound and you know, Jessica Lange. Um, I'm so behind on Game of Thrones, so I probably need to do a big catch up. Do a big move But, set but I tell you, I'm really looking forward to Picnic at Hanging Rock. <gasps> yes. And Top of the Lake. Yes. So stuff to look forward to being on, yes. Lots of things. Okay, and then we've got our final 15. <gasps> so. Here we go, and this is like first thing that comes to mind. Okay. You just have to, you, you can't fence it. Okay. It's okay. Straight in. Are you okay. ready? Yeah. Sydney or Melbourne? Melbourne. Beer or wine? Beer and wine together. Mm. Sorry, <laughs> oh, it has to be one of the others. Beer just as craft beer is getting crafty. Crafty. Vera or Jake? Vera. Phone call or text? Uh, neither. <laughs> text. <laughs> Facebook or Instagram? Instagram, probably, yeah. Passenger or driver? Driver, definitely. Although I was a passenger for the first 30 years of my life. That, that, you know, still, my first bit of my autobiography will be taking the wheel of life. If you don't drive, do it now. And I've now dedicated the next 30 years of my life to giving everybody lifts in payback for all the lifts that I got <laughs> completed. You are now the driver. Um, TV or book? Book. Winter or summer? Oh, it's a hard one. I grew up in Canada, so I have memories of Canadian up in the Yukon winters. So, soft spot for winter, but boy, oh boy, the sun is a beautiful thing. Heels or sneakers? Sneakers. Dine in or dine out? Dine in. Fries or salad? A fry wrapped in a lettuce leaf. <laughs> Loud or quiet? Quiet. Comedy or drama? Melon comedy. Sweets or savoury? Savoury. Tea or coffee? Coffee. And the last one, governor or prisoner? Governor. Thank you, Pamela Rabe. You have been absolutely amazing. And thank you all for, for tuning in. I'm sorry. In. If, uh, no, your questions, no, your questions have been amazing and I, I only wish we'd get to all of them because we've just been super excited to have you and we've enjoyed every moment of it action-packed you know in planning tonight's thing i actually can't said to, wait to see what happens yeah I, next. I said to i said to the pr girl i said how can i possibly cram every single question i have to ask pamela rave into, into one hour it's impossible so thank you for bearing with me thank you thanks for Kel. you're fabulous unpacking really really good oh, thank, thank you. you all thank you for watching thank you for your interest in the world of wentworth and one show, ep to go mm. that's <gasps> it season finale next week yes but then what but then what? Do you have any, actually, is it, do you have any plans for season finale watching? Where will you be watching season finale next week? Um, um, I'll, I'll be in Melbourne. I don't know, it'll be, it'll be a muddled freak cocktail and probably a, yeah. a 
chip wrapping most people. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Everyone else is going to copy. We're going to see. We're going to see it go <laughs> viral. <laughs> I want, I want to see those, um, those gifts now. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Pamela. And thank you for everything that you bring to this amazing show. Thanks, and I, I speak on behalf of, of all the fans. We absolutely adore you and we adore and love to hate Joan Ferguson. So thank you for another amazing season. Keep on And um, Keep we'll on have to find out what happens next week. Reminding you all at home, 8.30, Tuesday, showcase on Foxtel. And... Um, We'll have to She's leave it there and see see what, us all. see what becomes because we saw yeah. those eyes open. She isn't gone. Where to next? Where to next? Well, thank you so much, Pamela. Thank really you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Carol. See you guys. See ya.